Hey everybody, welcome to Making It. This is episode 92. I'm Bob Claggett, here with Jimmy Duresta. Hey guys, how are you? Doing well. And David Picciuto. Hi, how are you doing? Excellent, nailed it that time. <laughs> we don't have to do a retake, that's great. And we have a special guest, somebody that you probably don't know, but he's an up-and-coming woodworker. He's got some skill that he's working on, he's building it up, he's going to be something one of these days. The amazing Nick Offerman. Thank you, that's a generous introduction. How are you? I'm doing very well. I'm, I'm glad to be sitting down for a minute. Thanks for joining us, Nick. I appreciate it. Yeah, we're, we're super happy to have you on the show. And we're going to talk about his book. That's, that's what we're really here to talk about because it's an awesome new book. But we're going to go around like normal and talk about what we're working on. So, Jimmy, let's start with you. What are you up to? The other day in one of my vlogs, you guys know I started a vlog and it's slowly building a little bit of steam. And the other day in one of the vlogs, I was handed a piece of alabaster, which is a translucent stone. And the guy at the Complete Sculpt, my friend Mark, said, here, try this out. He goes, it sculpts just like, st- just like wood. He goes, it's just like a hardwood. And he gave me some tips on how to use it. So this morning I started a video of me using this alabaster. I haven't put it on the lathe yet, but I chucked it. I, I haven't chucked it up yet, but I put a epoxy piece of maple that I'm going to chuck onto the maple. And that was his suggestion. So I began that today. After we talked today, I'm going to go back and I'm going to spin it on the lathe and see how it works. But it's just a beautiful plug of alabaster. And he said, just put it on the lathe like, like it was a piece of wood and wear a dust mask. So I'm looking forward to playing with that in a few hours. And uh, I started another project today. I'm making these A-frame tool carriers that are going to be for the kindergarten classroom. So that's another video I'm working on. So that's what I'm up to today. I started those two videos. I'm really digging the vlog, by the way. Thank you. It's getting a lot of views. I really didn't know what to expect. You know, but it's funny. No, my views have not slowed down. In fact, they've actually increased a little bit, according to some of the analytics. But my my subscription base is like con- dropped considerably. My subscription, you know, rate is down about thirty percent. But I think it'll start to build again because I'm getting really good rave reviews on the vlog. So just keep at it. Do you think it's because you're voting for Gary Johnson? It might be. I'm gonna I'm gonna hold my tongue out and talk like a regular podcast. Jimmy's super super good at uh, making videos about making things. Oh, thank you. That's how that's what got us all here together. Actually, yeah, that's how we all met. It's been a great community. That sounds like you're having some good fun, and uh, I can't wait to see what you do with alabaster. Do you have plans for it? Uh, well, I'm gonna base it's a small chunk, so I'm gonna make a votive of it. I'm going to make it into like a little votive or a little cup. Really, I feel if I get that far and it doesn't blow apart on the lathe, I've accomplished something. So it's really just kind of getting my feet wet with the material. And then if I like it and I enjoy it, I'll get a bigger piece and work with a longer piece. So it's a four-inch plug. David, what about you? What have you been up to? As some of you guys know, I like to collect classic woodworking books. And sometime, and lately I've been doing projects out of those books. Well, tomorrow we're starting a project out of a future classic book. We are going to make the Barry Stool out of Nick Offerman's book. That's awesome. I had a feeling that, I had a feeling when I was reading it that you might do that. Yeah. Nick, correct me if I'm wrong. This is, uh, the stool in the book is a variation of Barry Wendell, right? Wendell Barry. Wendell Barry, I'm sorry. And um, I got a couple slabs to pull out of the garage, looking them over right now, and hopefully we're going to make, make this little stool tomorrow. That's really exciting. Yeah, it's. Um, I made a stool for this documentary about Wendell Berry, who's my favorite writer. He's a Kentucky farmer in his 80s, and he's the greatest living American writer. Uh, hmm. he, his, um, his fiction and poetry and essays are full of common sense and humor. And I think if we all read Wendell Berry, we'd, uh, we'd have a lot less hatred um, and waste in our country. But he, in this movie, he talks about people making things, and he mentions uh, making a piece of furniture or putting a stool together. And so the filmmaker had me, uh, she shot me making this three-legged stool, and I was very proud to, you know, uh, be a part of this film. And, um, and so we, we repeated the stool for the book, and uh, it's, it's cute. It's a really cute little three-legged stool. The great thing about three legs is uh, you can really screw it up terribly and it still won't wobble. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought about that. Awesome. Three legs is the way to go. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, for me, I haven't been up to anything. Um, Hurricane Matthew came through, uh, and we got kicked out of town on Thursday. And so we headed up to Atlanta and just been hanging out with friends and kind of riding it out. And I'm happy to say that our house is fine. We had no damage at all, as far as I can tell, from neighbors. And our power is back on, so we're headed back today, actually, after we record this. So that's awesome. Uh, but I haven't done anything except play with my kids in the park for the past several days. <laughs> I'd say that's a very good project to uh, have under your belt, especially in the wake of a of a weather disaster. Yeah. Your kids have no idea th- how lucky they are to have a dad in the park. Yeah. It's been, it's been interesting. My wife and I were talking about that. Like um, we didn't plan to go out, you know, on an impromptu vacation with no plans, right? Typically when you go on a vacation, you always have a bunch of stuff you want to try to accomplish. And we were just like, okay, we got to leave. So we left and then we're like, now what do we do for several days? And really our only option was, Hey, let's just like make the most of it and have fun and goof off and, you know, eat too much ice cream and stuff like that. And so it's turned out to be a really cool impromptu time with the, the family. So no distractions, which is great. It, that hel- it helps a lot that we know our house is there that we get to go back to. <laughs> That's a comfort. Well, Nick, what about you? Well, shucks. Uh, my, uh, my wife and I just did a, a two, like a two-month tour of a comedy show called Summer of 69, No Apostrophe. Uh, we, we toured up the East Coast. We played London and Dublin. Uh, we spent some time in Scotland uh, shooting some more Scotch commercials, which is a, a tough job, but uh, I'm willing to take it on my shoulders. And, um, <laughs> and then we did some shows down the West Coast, and now I'm getting ready to go out on tour uh, with this book. My book comes out uh, October 18th. And, um, so I've been in the shop, I'm back in LA and, uh, we're, we're doing a table. We did this table for a friend of mine. Um, that was a massive, uh, seven foot circular dining table made out of, of glue lamb beams that are seven by 24. So this, this client pulled these, this ceiling out of a warehouse and he wanted to reuse these big glue lamb beams. So he built structures and counters and and he had us build this circular dining table into which we sank uh, a lazy susan ring it's a really terrible uh idea it was incredibly difficult and uh lee at my shop did most of the engineering on this lazy susan ring and we ended up having to make three of them because the the composite we glued up uh some some uh eight, what's what's the jimmy what's the what are the letters for uh low density the plastic uh m d f no it's it's that white high phenol high phenolic p v c um uh h t p p v c h t p p v c f b i kanye is gonna turn turn sample this and turn it into a new hit song styrene no, it's, it's a plexiglass. It's a white phenolic plastic that's used in jigs uh, frequently. So oh, ni- we, nar- we did a nylon? ring of that. Kind of like a nylon. Uh, no, but I'm my my ignorance is poking through. You know, I saw. I don't know how you did it ultimately, but there's a simple way to. There's there is a potential simple way to solve that. Maybe this is what you did. If you make the ring the outermost ring, where you have like the most friction. And you drill, say, for instance, three quarter inch holes in that ring, and then you just drop marbles in it, and then that plastic ring essentially just keeps your marbles at every you know sixth of a circle, for instance, and then you're good. And then if you put three points inside the wall of the lazy susan, so it doesn't bounce off of any of the wood, and of course you got to just make sure you have a precise circle. That's uh, that's a super cool idea, and um, I think I think I'll pass that along to the gang. We're, we're doing a second version of it for a client, uh, out at the end of long Island actually. And, uh, um, oh, instead of doing a donut, we're going to do a full circle. So the whole center of the table is the lazy Susan. We did, you know, we did a slightly more complicated version of that where we took those ball rollers and screwed them down at regular intervals. And then the whole thing rests on it with a little indented groove, but of course, you have 
a, a much better Fred Flintstone idea. Um, it's one thing I love about Jimmy is like you, you order a bunch of expensive equipment and he'll look around in your like trash drawer and be like, Oh, here's a better way to do it with a, a pencil and a stick of butter. So there, as long, as long as you got a good center pivot point and this piece of plastic is just literally keeping your marbles in, in place. It's not actually rolling on them. So the, the, the bottom rolls on the bottom of the marble and the undecided lazy Susan rolls on the top of the marble. And the marble's not secured in place at all. My God. So I think the plastic that you're referring to, I, I did a quick Google search, is probably ultra-high molecular weight polyethylene. Yeah, buddy. UHMV. I never heard of that. I just learned that. I never heard of that before. It's great. You know, like you get, you get sheets of it at, the wood, at Woodcraft or at Rockler, and it's great for making little jigs, you know, little sliding sleds and stuff. Um, so we're working on that. And the, these days, uh, I have the luxury of administrating. So I come in and answer questions and, you know, a couple of our guys, Josh and Thomas are doing all the, the muscle work and, you know, this, we're making it out of live Oak, this live Oak slab that came down in Los Angeles. Uh, our good friends have started an operation called angel city lumber where they're for the first time, there's an urban milling operation right here in Los Angeles. So this came down a few months ago. They put it through their kiln. It's really crazy, uh, gnarly, ornery grain, really dense and massive. So it's going to be a huge, beautiful table. Um, so I, I get to oversee that. Uh, meanwhile, I have a bunch of wood that's been waiting for me. Uh, I've made my first ukulele. And I've got all the wood ready to make 16 or 20 more of them. And as soon as I get done with this book tour, I'll dive into that. That was actually something I was going to ask you about. Because I remember listening to, I think it was an episode of the Nerdist podcast that you did a long time ago. Like two years ago or something. And I remember you saying that you wanted to start doing ukuleles. So I was curious how far you'd gotten on that track. I made my first one. And, I, and then the problem is I keep having so much fun with showbiz. So... Uh, instead of making more ukuleles, I then went on tour as a humorist, and I play my ukulele, and I, I wrote a song about it, and um, and that's a lot of fun. And now, now it's time to go back in and and keep going. And then once once I feel like I've nailed the ukulele, then I'll take a swing at acoustic guitars. Nice, right. that's cool. So, how much time do you get, like, actually in the shop in a? six month period or something. It's very sporadic. I mean, sometimes like, uh, part of the reason I chose to do this book was so that I could tell my agents, leave me alone. I'm going to be in my shop for four months working on this book. And that was a huge treat to get a four month stretch. Uh, usually it's a week or two at a time in, in, in any given six months, it could be two weeks or it could be two months. Uh, it all depends on if I'm working on films or in town or out of town or what have you. Um, but the nice thing is, especially bec having become a writer of books, uh, I've become, I, I'm sort of a self-appointed evangelist of, of woodworking. So even when I'm touring the country, I'm going to visit other woodworkers or tool makers or shops around the, around the country. And, and uh, so that's what made this book really fun too, is like, I'm not just driving up the coast. I'm stopping in and visiting with, with other woodworkers and, and continuing to learn. Um, I was in Boston last fall doing a play, and I, I spent a lot of time at the North Bennett Street School and took a, a Windsor chair class from Peter, Peter Galbert. Um, and that was incredibly exciting. It was the first time that I had an actual teacher rather than a book or a magazine or a Jimmy DeResta video. And, um, <laughs> man, it was, I, I literally teared up a few times at, at the incredible power of having the person in the room telling you what you're doing right or wrong with the draw knife. I was just was like, I'm, I'm 46 and I finally made it to school. I'm, I'm so grateful. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. We have a friend that went to that school. We told you about Kyle. He's in the community here, and he's, he's a great woodworker. He's been there. That school and many like it. I talk about it in, in my book. Uh, all over the country, there are these great schools that are hanging on 
and I'm so glad they are that, you know, teach just artisanal craftsmanship. That school has book binding and, and violin making and just yep. re- really old school, you know, not only cabinet making and like period furniture, but they also teach um, like historical architectural carpentry. So, you know, it's graduates of that school that, that are being hired by the Biltmore estate to come in and fix their staircase and, you know, all the other beautiful woodwork that modern carpentry has left behind. Yeah. I've got a, a friend that went, went there for bookbinding and uh, we got to visit the school one time when she was taking classes and it was pretty amazing. It's a really, at least the part we were in was a really compact place of just people really getting good at what they do. And she's gone on to do a bunch of book restoration stuff that, you know, most people are not qualified to touch and she can go in and fix it. Hmm. So it's pretty awesome. It is. It feels like just walking the halls of a space that's devoted to a craft that refined has a, a real Hogwarts feeling to it of like, oh my God, I, anything I learned here would would be considered a superpower in most other schools. Yeah, it's a good way. It's a good way to put it. Tell us about the book. Like like you, you kind of said, you know, that you were working on it, but like for people who haven't seen it yet, it's a lot different than your other books. It is. I mean, my first two books are all prose and they're, you know, uh, either stories from my life or my second book is profiles of great Americans rendered with, with sincerity, but with a sense of humor. And then this book is an eight by 10. It's a textbook size, uh, woodworking book. And it's first and foremost, it's the, it's, I, I think it's inarguably the funnest woodworking book I've ever seen. And because I'm not a master woodworker, you know, I'll never have a school of like the Nick Offerman technique. You know, I, I uh, am happy to be a student of woodworking as long as my, my fingers uh, are ho- holding on. Um, and so instead of, of, you know, come out with, with some mastery book, it was more of an introduction. A lot of my fan base uh, has been asking me to do a woodworking book, and that combined with uh, my desire to get back in my shop is what, what brought this about. And so I just wanted to, to introduce as many people as I could to woodworking, but also, so it's a book about woodworking. I talk about wood. I talk about my own history with tools and how I've come to where I am um, uh, but then, but then, even more so, every person in my shop, there's six woodworkers in my shop, and my dad and my brother in Illinois, also, uh, they make cribbage boards and birdhouses that we sell on my website, so they're kind of like Offerman Woodshop Midwest. Um, they each have a chapter. So it's, it's, the, the book is also uh, sort of an, an, an instructional treatise in a way of life as a maker, like don't just learn to do something like woodworking, which is so rewarding um, and, ju- and just such a, a, a healthy discipline to add to your life. Don't, don't just leave it at that as a solitary pursuit, but find others who want to make things and get together with a community of people because that has made my life so rewarding and happy whether I'm making theater or films or, or, you know, building houses or building furniture or building canoes, I get together with other people who, who make things. And maybe, maybe I'm making a canoe and my buddy Marty is making a dining table and you can wait, you can, you have two heads are better than one. So like Marty, come here and look at this. Or like when I built my first canoe and Jimmy was just there shooting the whole thing, you can see, some of that on YouTube or it's available uh, as a DVD, which is a way people used to view um, um, <laughs> audio visual medium. It's like a di- shiny disc, like from an old movie. Um, but even, even when Jimmy was there shooting the whole thing, you know, Jimmy's such a thinker and such a, an inventor that every, at every turn, and he wasn't even that experienced at the, at the time with woodworking, but he's such a great practical brain. And so I'd say, hey, I'm having a hard time sanding this curve. And he would say, uh, well, here's three ideas looking around. He's like, try this. And he's like <laughs> making little sanding jigs. And so the the book is very that was much straight, a that was right out of uh, That was right out of auto body work, whatever I gave you those days. So, 
you know, all disciplines cross. Yeah, that's the thing is like there's no there's no rules, you know. Part of getting into fine woodworking is I think it can be intimidating when you look at the at the beautiful Lee Nielsen tools or you, you look at like some incredible dovetails. To me, initially that was really intimidating where I was like, geez, that yeah, you got to go to college for something like that. And it, instead, I want I want this book to be a very comforting introduction that says if you build a really crappy doghouse and you hammer it together with nails and, and nothing lines up, but it provides shade and shelter for your dog, you're a woodworker. Like that's a, you, you've, you've begun. Let now maybe your next dog house will be better. Or maybe now you'll build a back porch. And so the, it's so rewarding and, and fun to make things with tools. And the, you know, it doesn't have to go into a museum. If you make anything for your household or your yard or your family or friends, that's something that you didn't have to purchase. It's something that Ikea didn't have to burn a bunch of diesel fuel to ship to you. It, you know, you didn't add a bunch of packing materials to the landfill. I, on and on and on. It's just, it's a way of life that uh, I found to be very healthy. And so this book is kind of a guide to to find that way of life for yourself. Even if you end up making stained glass windows or leather belts or sex toys. Um, <laughs> It's a celebration. It's and and that's what makes the book so fun. Everybody has a profile. Um, there, there's a chapter on cookouts where we all give a recipe. My wife does this hilarious uh, section on shop fashion. That's really funny. Um, so that, you know that I I love writing books, and this is something that was just really easy to to say. Oh my god, I could I could write. I could have so much fun writing all about woodworking and trying to get people turned on to it. Can I ask a question, Nick? Could you could you do like a quick explanation of how the Offerman Woodshop works? I know you explained it in the book, but for the people listening, because everybody has the misunderstanding that everybody there works for you and that you're like the guy that comes in and like touches something then leaves. Yeah, happily. Um, I, it used to be just me by myself um, and I'd like hire a couple helpers, you know, when I needed them for several years. Then when I got the job on Parks and Recreation, I, I knew how things worked, and I, I had a feeling that if this show took off, that I, I would have to like shut off the lights at my shop and lock the door, and that really bummed me out. And so I started looking around, and I met Lee, who is this incredible superhero, heroic little woman who – I say little because she's small, but she's like – she's worth three of me. She's such a badass. So I met her – and she was just perfect to run the shop. So together we then collected other people and ended up with like six people. And we've set it up as a collective because, you know, uh, I, I, I make my living through showbiz. And so I'm not, I don't make any income from the shop. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm the uh, figurehead and I am the administrator and, you know, it's, it's my machines and everything. But we've set it up as a, a co-op or a collective, so everybody's an independent contractor. We have we have a really nice online store, so everybody can create their own products. You know, this guy Matt Macucci created a bottle opener and a wooden kazoo, and he can he sells those on the website, and he can determine if he wants to make a batch of twelve or if he wants to make twelve batches of twelve. He he determines how many he makes. Uh, we all. We all weigh in to determine the price point um, to make sure that – we try to make sure that everybody's making at least about 20 bucks an hour. Um, and so then we also do a lot of commissions where – but it, it works really well because Lee is such a great administrator. So while everybody is making their web products, we also take private commissions and we do a lot of one-off high-end slab tables, cabinetry, butcher's block, you know, beds um, – all kinds of custom stuff. Uh, and you know, and it, it's, it's ever morphing. It's a very malleable collective. Um, but no, no, it, you know, it's not like a Jeff Koontz situation. I'm, I'm very outspoken. I, and what I mean by that is I'm not an artist that like has a group of 12 people making my art and then I just sign it. Right. We're, I'm very outspoken about the fact it's, it's funny because I'm the guy on TV. People want to believe that their baseball bat was turned by Ron Swanson, 
Well, Ron Swanson uh, is a character from a TV show, so he he has never shown up to work. Uh, and anything that I make, I sign. <laughs> um, but I'm I'm very proud of the fact that everything you buy at our shop is made by these hardworking Americans that are like making their living as woodworkers. Um, it's a it's a weird thing because people love you know, the media and like they're, they're fascinated with celebrity. So they have this idea where they're like, I got a, I got a kazoo. I got a mustache comb made by Ron Swanson. Well, that's just people being dumb. Uh, you know, they got a mustache comb from my shop that was made by whoever it says, you know, makes it on the website. Um, so the, it's, it's something that we're, we're very open about and that I'm proud about. I, I'm very proud of the fact that I've never exploited Ron Swanson or Parks and Rec. We never even mentioned that on the website. Like, you know what I mean? It'd, it'd be so easy to be like Ron Swanson's, you know, whiskey cabinet. But I would rather that that the shop and the woodworkers succeed on the merits of our work rather than exploiting our connection to popular culture. I was actually really curious about that. I know you've probably talked about this before in other interviews. I'm sure. You know, the character seems to have a fair amount in common with you personally, from what I know about you at a distance. Um, like, how is that? Does that get old or do you like embrace that? Or do you, are you like trying to separate from that character that you played or, you know, how is that? Well, it's weird. I mean, it's, it's many headed. Uh, I am quite different from Ron Swanson. I mean, he's, he's a brilliantly written comedy character that if you, if you ran everything you've ever seen of him together, you know, you'd end up with maybe 52 minutes of material. Like it's when you think about it and it's something we also experienced with my wife, Megan Mullally on Will and Grace, like people really, because you're in their living room, they, they really think they own you and they come to know you, but, but then, but then they make a lot, they have a lot of misconceptions. Um, Yes, I'm a woodworker. Uh, yes, I love steak and bacon and scotch. Who doesn't? Uh, but, you know, that guy that guy was a cartoon character. So I have uh, a real-life digestive system. <laughs> so it's a weird thing because on one hand, it's, it's brought me a lot of incredible great fortune, and it still does. I mean, I certainly, uh, I certainly benefit from people's... Um, appreciation of the show and the character that, uh, you know, it's uh, clearly a lot of the traffic we get at on the website comes from people who are fans of the show. And, and that's great. You know, it, it allows us to run this shop where six woodworkers are making a living. I mean, I, I appreciate that that's a super lucky situation. Um, but then at the same time, it makes me want to say, look, you know, when people when people say like Ron Swanson made this or or even Nick Offerman made this, I'm like, no, clearly I'm not making any of this stuff on the website. Uh, and so I just yeah, ultimately, even when people are insulting, where like sometimes I'll get invited to speak at a college and they'll say, we don't even care if Nick Offerman shows up. We just want Ron Swanson for 90 minutes. And I'll say, I, under, I understand that you mean that as a compliment, but... I actually am Nick Offerman, so you could understand that that, that could be hurtful. <laughs> or people often say, uh, I saw Nick Offerman without his mustache. I, I vomited and then died. And, <laughs> and I'll say, look, I, I, I can work that into a compliment, but that's my, uh, that's my f-ing face you're talking about. Um, so <laughs> for the sake of my mother, if nothing else, please understand you know that it's i don't mean for it to be to come across as nauseating it's just what it's what, the hand i've been given it's the hand i've been dealt so uh please forgive me so you know it it has its ups and downs but ultimately um it's it's a wonderful piece of good, of good fortune you used to build sets correct back in chicago i did yeah i i i, I, went, I went to theater school and started building scenery there for wages you know in the scene shop. And then when I was in Chicago in the nineties, um, I would basically build scenery during the day and then act in plays at night. So I really, um, and and I ended up, you know, opening my own little shop in a warehouse to build scenery for my own theater company and other little, little outfits. And so I became, um, 
you know, very well versed in running a shop that, that built things pretty exclusively out of plywood and luon and, and one by and two by material. Uh, so I was very good at the table saw and the chop saw and the screw gun. And we, and there was, there was one wood, woodworker one time who had a roll of chisels. Uh, his name was Brad Bunn and we all made fun of him for, for, you know, being like, Oh Brad, did you, did you bring your nice chisels? You know, and we, we gave him a really hard time. And then probably seven or eight years later, by the time I had really gotten into woodworking and I remembered him one day, like the first day that I got my, my first chisel roll, I was like, Oh my God, I was such a to Brad Bunn. And I, I tracked him down so that I could apologize to him. <laughs> if anybody <laughs> out so there uh, knows Brad, I, I reiterate, I apologize. That was uh, terrible bullying from some ignorant scenic carpenters. Where did fine woodworking come in to play? Well, I moved to Los Angeles uh, in the late 90s, and to, you know, I was trying to get something going on. And meanwhile... I was building stuff for people. I built a couple cabins in people's yards and like a nice Frank Lloyd Wright inspired deck. And I, I discovered in my travels out here, uh, these architects, Green and Green, who were contemporaries of Frank Lloyd Wright at the turn of the 20th century. And Pasadena is kind of the ground zero of their gorgeous craftsman, uh, craftsman style inspired by Japanese and Chinese architecture lines. Look up green and green. Their stuff is just incredibly exquisite craftsman lodge, uh, construction. Now it was super expensive. Like the, the gamble house in Pasadena, which is run like a museum. You can go tour it. The, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing the numbers, but the guys that built it, uh, they had like 140, guys in the yard for a year and a half cutting all this joinery all the joinery is exposed and it's like triple layered with wedges and leather and steel so like it has that craftsman aesthetic where the actual joinery is the decoration but they just took it to the nth degree and and all the furniture and all the light fixtures everything is of a piece and I, i was really moved by it so I was building this yoga studio in somebody's yard and I, it was green and green inspired. So there was a bunch of timber framing to do for the first time for me. And I was cutting these giant, you know, I, I was all excited. I bought these huge Robert Sorby framing chisels and I'm knocking out these huge mortise and tenon joints. And in the middle of doing that one day and like fitting this massive joint, it just occurred to me, I, in my ignorance, I, I thought, oh, I think this is how antique furniture is put together. Um, and, you know, a, a contractor friend of mine who did really high-end work, I said, hey, I've, I've been doing a bunch of mortise and tenon joints. Uh, isn't this how, like, a, a antique French table was made? And he's like, hang on. And he went in his office and came back and handed me fine woodworking. And he said, just start reading this. And I did, and that was, that was like 1998, and I just f- freaked out. I uh, was like, oh, my God. <laughs> this is what I'm talking about. And um, be- I suppose because I had become so established with my set of tools and, like, I, here's all the things I can make. Like, I can build your set for your play. I can build a deck. You know, I can frame a house. Um, I I was already kind of set up as a lone wolf or I, I was pretty solitary. And so instead of, and because I was still trying to find work as an actor, I just tucked away by myself with fine woodworking and started reading the books of Krenov and Nakashima and, uh, uh, T T T A G E freed. They, they told me how to say his name, right? It's, you know, I'm talking about Teg Fried, T A G E Fried. He he's one. He has one of the greatest uh, woodworking instructional books. So, so I became very self-taught. Um, and you know, eventually, if you geek out hard enough, you order all the back issues of fine woodworking. <laughs> and and I did. You know, and I built a special case for them. And I I still 
just devour it. And popular popular woodworking as well. I, I more recently got hooked on that. And you know, with those between those and the internet, it, it's like going to a college these days. It, it's, it'll never replace the the influence of being in a room with a teacher. But we are incredibly lucky, especially if you're out in the middle of Kansas or something. If you're far away from any woodworking school, it's amazing the amount of information you can you can still get your hands on. So we have heard Jimmy's story on how the two of you met. I want to hear your story, your side of it, just to confirm that Jimmy is telling us the truth. How did you meet Jimmy Duresta? Uh, okay, well... <laughs> Finally get to the truth. <laughs> Preface this by saying I was not, I had never been to a steam bath before. Um, so I, is this sounding familiar? So um, they, they blindfold you. This is, now this is the Lower East Side of New York City. Uh, very Russian influenced uh, massage parlor, let's, let's call it. Um, just kidding. Uh, so I did, I did a TV show. Uh, called American Body Shop with Jimmy's brother, John DeResta, who's a very funny stand-up and actor. And we worked on this show, and John also, like, builds furniture. Um, you know, he's also a, a maker. And and he was like, oh, man, you know, let me check out your stuff, look at my tables. And, you know, we, we sort of bonded over that. And he's like, you got to meet my brother, Jimmy. He All he does is make stuff. He's insane. And so, and the timing was such that right after we did 10 episodes of that show, um, Comedy Central balled it up and threw it away uh, (laughs) because that was apparently their business model at the time. It was a pretty good show. Uh, But then my wife uh, got cast in Young Frankenstein on Broadway, so we moved to New York for her to do that show. And I said, okay, I'm getting away from my shop. I've had my shop going for a few years now. Um, And I'm leaving my shop, but I've been reading a lot about canoes. I really want to make a canoe. So I'll bring a bag of chisels and planes and and stuff. And maybe I can find a place in New York to build my first canoe. So I got to New York uh, and I called, Jimmy was my first call. I was like, hey, you know, I know your brother. Can I come check out your shop? specifically for this canoe project, but generally, you know, I just would like to meet you. So I went down to his shop one day and, and, you know, and the rest is like, it's the greatest love story ever told. Uh, We we sat there for hours as you do, um, you know, just guys in their shops like, oh my God, what is this? Oh, you know, Jimmy, Jimmy's shop is such a, an amazing, um, magician's laboratory because because of his affinity for it's everyone. The same one. Say what? It's the same shop that I'm still in. It's been about that nine eight, nine years ago. And this is and this is before Jimmy really took off in woodworking. He was just starting to explore wood. And so he he made a lot of stuff out of wood, but it was only one of his his materials. Like and that that's what Yeah, at the time I was doing more toy prototyping. Yeah. And I mean from the get go he was like Oh yeah, uh, no, I'm, gonna, I'm working on a rocking chair. Uh, we can make it out of steel, a glass, or I can pour it out of resin. No, I'm from Long Island. Uh, and immediately, you know, I don't have, like Jimmy not only can make all this stuff, but as you well know, he can, he can take a Sharpie and like draw a perfect uh, 3D rendering of anything, which is not something I can do. So I immediately was like, you're, you are Gandalf. Um, and so his shop didn't really have enough space to make the canoe, but we, I think we hit it off as friends and just like, you know, shop bros. And I continued to look around. I found a shop space in Red Hook, which is a neighborhood in Brooklyn and Jimmy spot. Yeah, this really cool old stone Civil War era warehouse with the Statue of Liberty out the window. And I don't I mean, we just like, you know, we we had a bromance where we drove up to Bear Mountain Boats in Peterborough together in the dead of winter. And we met Joan and Ted who run Bear Mountain Boats. And, that you know, 
we we laid out how we were going to do a video for them. We were at the house for two nights and it was kind of awkward. We were like, I slept in my clothes. Like I was like, I don't even know where we were, or what we were doing. <laughs> like that's the, that's the good heartedness of, of this community. I think it's why that's, that it's the same thing that made me write this book is like, I'm telling you guys at speaking to the audience, this life feels really good. You, I guarantee you won't make as much money is if you try to go into some business where you make a bunch of money. But I'm telling you, I've, I've been all over the world and I've, I've made a lot of money and a little money. And this life has so much more recompense and reward. It's the kind of thing that'll t- send me and Jimmy to Canada to sleep in two strangers farmhouse. And here years later, we still adore this couple and we do everything we can with them because they teach people to build canoes. And, and so, you know, is at every possible turn, I Jimmy's my first call. Whenever I visit New York, I go see Jimmy. I never have time to, but I don't care. I just I go get lost in his shop, and we have a coffee. And it, it's so funny, and I, I talk about this in the book because there's a profile on Jimmy. It, I, I know that whenever I go there that he's going to teach me something. He'll be like, oh, I like your belt buckle. Let me tell you about the history of how that was created. Or, you know, he'll be like, <laughs> Do you smell that? Yeah, across the street, the the grinding the uh, these parking meters, and there, you, there's a new kind of grinding wheel. Like he just is an he, he has to know how everything is made and what it's made of, and then his sickness is he then has to tell all of us, and so <laughs> we are the beneficiaries. He never gets enough sleep, but we are the lucky ones that that are that have the the ears and eyes to to listen to his teaching. Thank you. Mm, beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. That's cute. I must say, I want. I just want to add one thing that uh, I don't. I probably talked about it here on the show briefly, but I remember when you first asked me, you said, "Hey, do you want to drive to Canada to go meet these guys and pick up the thing?" And I, I initially said, "No, I have too much to do," and you know, I didn't know you that well at the time, and and I was busy, and I was like always afraid to peel away from work because I figured the world would collapse, and. I thought about it for a minute and I was like, here's an opportunity to get away from what I'm doing, hang out with somebody who's cool and have a new opportunity and meet Joan and Ted. Cause we had watched Ted's video of him building a boat and we were both sort of enamored by him. And I, I after thinking about it for a couple of days, I called you back. I said, Hey, can I still go? Let's, let's do this together instead of you going on your own. And it was really a moment when you think of these moments in, in life, when you're like, I'm glad I made that decision and, and I didn't miss out on that opportunity because like you said, Joan and Ted, we talk all the time. We went to Belize with Joan and Ted Taylor and I a couple of years ago. We had a wonderful time with them. And I just missed out on one of Ted's boat classes only because I was busy here in New York. But it's something I plan on doing soon. And, uh, you know, it was, it, was change, it was a life-changing experience, for real. It was. And, and I want to re- reiterate your point that you, you almost didn't do it because of, like, making money and the rat race, basically. You're like, no, 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 I got I to gotta make money. And, but then you, you followed your gut and you did do it. And so we've both been in this relationship together and with them for, I don't know, 10 years now, something like that. And we haven't made a, much profit, you know, like it's, and it's something, but I've had several people, a few dozen by now, contact me and say, Hey, I watched your canoe video or I I watched this Jimmy thing or somehow with Bear Mountain Boats, I got involved and me and my dad built a canoe. Like the, the recompense is so much more delicious than dollars. And, and it's, I think it's, that's, that's what my book is all about. And that's what my, my evangelical stance is, is like, trust me, get off your phone and find something to make with your hands and that, that's what we're all part of. I mean, that's what your podcast is about is like th- there's there is a much better America to be found in in this subject matter than in I don't, I, video games are amazing. They're super fun. But I, but that's that's like eating the most delicious dessert. You should save that for a, v- a very small portion of your time. So it remains a treat. And then the rest of your time, you can have treats like building a canoe and that can if you play your cards right, that can be your job. Mm, well said. So with this book, like you, it sounds like it's pretty near and dear to you. Um, do you think you'll have other stuff like this going forward? 
you know, like a part two in the works or anything? May, it, it's a great question. I, you never know with me just because uh, it, it, it's a really fun roller coaster. You know, um, I, I have a, I, I do have an idea uh, eventually um, for when I build my first guitar. I think I want to make that into a book, um, and it all depends on how this book does. You know, it is we are in the book business right now at Offerman Woodshop, and so if the book does great, you know, uh, it could turn into things like good, good, clean, fun part two, or it could, you know, maybe the shop does a book that I have less to do with, or, you know, it could be, it could answer in any number of ways, but a few of our woodworkers have started teaching workshops in Los Angeles. And that, that is something that I'm very interested in, you know, in like, uh, not only reaching the, the online community, but reaching our local community. There's a lot of families that want to bring their kids to start teaching them how to use tools because a lot of schools have done away with shop programs. And so, it, you know, anything I can do, it, if, if there's an audience for it, I will probably always continue to encourage people to get involved with handcrafting, but particularly wood, woodworking, since that's my jam. Okay, well, I have another question for you then. So if uh, it sounds like guitar might be the next thing that you want to try out, but outside of like the specific projects like that, you've, you've kind of run the gamut of set stuff to framing work to fine woodworking. You got a favorite area? Do you have a favorite, like, I could just do this all day kind of skill set? You know, it's all so fun. I mean, the, the, the techniques are very different. I mean, it, now, granted, I was, uh, it was 20 years ago, 25, that I was framing houses so standing on a, a sill plate three stories up, like t- tapping in rafters, w- was incredibly fun and adventurous. You know, there, there's an element of extreme sports to it that I might not be quite as keen on here at age 46. But, you know, taking a pile of, of two-by material and turning that into a, a house ha- is incredibly satisfying. And then coming back... And like meticulously hitting all the miters and, and trimming out that house is satisfying in yet another way. And then going into a shop and cranking out a dining room set or a bed or a rocking chair or a porch swing is is yet another level of of magic. So they're all they're all creating. Um, for me, I guess, and I just I just taught a workshop last weekend where it, it was a bunch of absolute beginners. And so I had each each of them use a handsaw to cut off the end of a maple plank, and I got some beautiful maple from Gobi Walnut in uh, in Portland, Oregon. Beautiful spalted big leaf maple. So each each person cut off like a twelve inch squarish, and we were just making cutting boards. And just to see these people, because they're absolute newbies, strike a line. And, and, you know, we had slow coaching and sawhorses, and there were eight-year-olds and there were 68-year-olds. And every single one of them succeeded in cutting off a piece of this plank. And just that was so satisfying because they, they, were, they felt the power. They were like, oh, my God, I, yeah. using, using tools, I can shape the world around me. And then we just sanded them and drilled a hole in it and oiled it. And they, you would have thought that they had built a Corvette. They were like, look what I made. Look at this. I'm a, I'm a woodworker. I was like, well, yeah, you, you have a few more things to learn, but that you're off to a good start. <laughs> and so, I mean, that, that's kind of the answer to your question is like, I can still just sand a scrap of walnut and oil it and crank up the Neil Young and, and be like, this is the greatest pastime anyone could ever have the other answer to your question though is i'm really obsessed with uh watercraft and musical instruments like taking everything i've learned so far about using tools to shape wood having the end result either be traveling on the water successfully or playing music that's beautiful um or in my case uh mediocre um that to, there's something there's something in the alchemy of that 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 i think that that'll remain my fascination 
probably for the rest of my careers, it will be making musical instruments and boats. Um, I, uh, tables are a gas. I mean, cutting joinery and having it work, you know, and using all the compiled knowledge of all the woodworkers that have led up to us just feels incredible, you know, to, to make a, a Christian Bexfort, who's a, a a modern master of the shaker style. He's also featured in the book and he's the most prolific fine woodworking, um, contributor over 40 years. He has like 80 articles or something. And he's one of these guys who, you know, they, they, they have all these techniques that I never would have heard of where like on a, on a, um, a breadboard end on a table where they lock down one point, but the rest of it is a sliding dovetail so that the breadboard and the the table planks can expand and contract with the with the humidity, but the, but the breadboard end will always remain in one place. Like that that really has a powerful magic to it. Um, and so you know, I I can be just as happy turning a, a miniature baseball bat, um, I, which makes me feel lucky. I'm 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 a I'm a sap. Uh, it's it's like being in a happy marriage. I'm, I'm 16 years in, and I can still look at my wife every day and and just smile and be like, man, I'm I'm going to do the dishes because I am a lucky son of a bitch, and I want you to stay married to me. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, can I talk just for a second about? Um Another thing you, you obviously seem to love, because uh, I see it in you, is the idea of harvesting the wood that you're going to use to make something, and the idea of sourcing it and finding it and the guys that, that harvest it. I, I know you have a special relationship with some guys that actually do that. And uh, we have a couple guys in our community. Matt Cremone is one who, who slabs his own stuff up in his yard and, and makes his own stuff from, from the trees he harvests. So I know you guys do that quite a bit. You want to talk about that for just a second? Sure. I mean, when I first began, you know, I met some guys in Northern California that, you know, there, there are, there are big shots who, uh, who harvest like semi loads of walnut and maple, you know, and, and, and they have contracts with furniture companies. Uh, and, and then I, you know, those guys are too expensive. So then I find these guys who like get, find the, the one crappy tree that fell off the wrong side of the hill and they're like, okay, I, I found one walnut tree. Come on in, and, and, and I'm going to slab it up. And then eventually, you know, if, if you're at all aware of, of the ecology, uh, as woodworkers, we can't help but be aware that we have pretty much raped the planet of all the available old growth trees. Uh, you know, there, we're, we're still cleaning out the dregs, but by and large, um, Great old trees are really hard to come by, but the, we do also learn that there's wood everywhere. I mean, in Los Angeles, which is a very arid climate, there's a ton of deciduous trees coming down every day because of weather, because of age, because of disease, because of uh, construction, you know. And so eventually, you know, first somebody calls you and is like, hey, this this white oak tree fell in Pasadena from the wind. And so you're like, hey, who, who, can I, how, how can I get that tree? And then we spent some money, you know, like having a few trees hauled to the shop. That was prohibitively expensive, but we had to learn the hard way. Then we milled those up with an Alaskan mill. Then So then you find somebody who's got a truck, who's got a crane. And, I mean, you know, we've been at it for all these years, but we're still – finally our buddies finally started this milling outfit where they've got a truck they mill the stuff up they've got a kiln um but wherever i go i i say to people a lot of the stuff we've made we've made out of like stumps we've grabbed off the side of the road or if you live in a city if you just drive the alleys near construction sites construction dumpsters or just generally there's there's wood every place and so if you can bring a reclaimed element into your pieces, you're doing, you know, you're saving trees, you're, you're help doing your part for, for mother nature, but you're also saving money. You know, you can go online. If you want a beautiful slab of walnut, if you're willing to pay any price, you can 
find all kinds of stuff online and they'll ship it right to you and it costs as much as a as a new Prius. Um, yeah. <laughs> or, or you can do some homework and find someone in your neighborhood or in the next county who has a line on a mill or, it's, you know, maybe you won't find exactly what you're looking for. Maybe you'll, you're looking for walnut, but you'll find black acacia or you'll find, uh, you know, madrone or something. And then you can go to your client and say, look, we can spend all this money for walnut or there's this amazing hardwood called alder or, you know, um, or hackberry or what have you. And maybe instead of a slab, we glue up a tabletop from four slices. It, it still looks amazing. It's, it's not a walnut slab, but it's a quarter of the price, and, and we're, it's a much, much, a much greener choice. So it's something we're always paying attention to. And for us, for our style, which is very inspired by the furniture of George Nakashima and now his daughter, Mira Nakashima, out of Pennsylvania, who's also featured in the book, they really popularized like the the one slab tabletop with the live edges. Uh, many people, you know, do wonderful work in that style. But that's for us. That's kind of our favorite thing to do is is a massive slab table. And so we're always very interested. That's that's a big piece of equipment and a lot of labor required to just make that board uh, nice enough to be a table. So we're very interested in always being aware of who in our neighborhood, you know, it's a farm to table situation, like who's raising the grass fed chicken and who, who has the best deal on it in our neighborhood. So you, you mentioned like this, that style, since you have multiple people coming into the shop as a co-op, um, I'm sure you don't try to like enforce a style of any kind at the shop in general, but does it kind of work out that everybody ends up kind of feeding into a particular style? Like does the shop have a style or do the individuals have the really unique thing or, you know, what's the balance? I I suppose, uh, I suppose yes, that the shop has sort of an aesthetic. I mean, just based on the, the pieces I first made um, and, and that was all based on my own proclivity and sort of the, and what I could do with the tools I had and uh, oftentimes working by myself. Um, so the, the shop is sort of set up, you know, it's not set up for marquetry or inlay or, you know, um, a lot of like Michael fortune, big steam bending or anything like that. It's, it's set up for specific tasks. Uh, that said, each, each woodworker sort of brings their own, particular notions to each piece. And so there, there's a slab table in the book that one of our young guys named Thomas does, and it's a beautiful walnut slab, but he makes a pretty modern looking geometric base out of uh, red oak. And then he ebonized it. So it's this, it's this sort of double parallelogram black, you know, geometric base. And there, there have been a lot of pieces come through the shop that have a, a very modern feel to them. Uh, it's interesting. I I think that, uh, because of that, it's a certain style of piece that designers and clients come to us looking for, but we're kind of open to everything. You know, um, we, we, we don't go into commissions with, with a set style. Uh, we talk to each client about what they want and then we just do our best to organically design to their desires. We don't want to hold you for the rest of the afternoon, Nick, if, if you got some place to go. Well, I, I'm about to go jump in a car and go to Austin uh, to do some showbiz work. And then, and then uh, I start my book tour in New York City. Uh, so I suppose we should get together in about a week. Part, part of why you're included in the book uh, and why I'm very grateful to you guys for having me on your podcast is because I, I love that this is happening, you know, that uh, people of our generation and the younger generations are really interested in reclaiming these hand skills, you know, that, that, um, that consumerism has sort of really let erode in a, in a large part of our population and, it, and it's exciting to see young people discover the joys of a simple Phillips screwdriver. 
where they're like, it fits right in there. It's, that's amazing. <laughs> you talked about earlier when you made the canoe with Jimmy, like you could bounce off questions off of him and he would come back with three answers or whatever. And woodworking generally is like a solitary thing that you do by yourself. But with technology these days, with podcasts and YouTube and websites, we can all like interact and ask each other questions and we can all problem solve together because a lot of woodworking is problem solving. You you get to a point and you're like, I don't know how to fix this or I don't know how to go any further. And you just turn to the internet and that answers your question. So podcasts and YouTube, it's just a, it's just a great way for everybody to interact and kind of work together, even though we're all separate. It really is. I think it's the future. And uh, starting with Bear Mountain Boats, like fine woodworking, because I discovered the actual magazine, so I still stick with it. Like I know that it's all online and you can get the whole thing, you know, as a download. But I, for me, especially with woodworking, I like to have the artifact and like my book, for example, I like to have it on the bench so I can flip the pages and mark it, you know, rather than have a, a laptop or an iPad that's going to get all full of, of linseed oil. Um, but so, so I'm, I'm more old school in that way. But then when I started working on canoes and I would have questions or I would have a, just a daunting step where I'm like, okay, I know, I know what the book says, but I'm just nervous about new materials like two-part epoxy and fiberglass and so then I I knew Bear Mountain Boats had this online forum and I would go on there and now I do it as a habit if like if there's something that I'm trying for the first time I'll just find the forum and see a bunch of people are like hey I had a hard time with this material and you get to it just like you said you, you get to share everyone's problem solving in this hive mind and that that is so comforting because it just saves you weeks of, of making mistakes. You know, you can say, ah, I'm not sure about this. And you can, you can go online and say, aha, I'm glad I looked because I would have done that wrong. Yeah. You can move your starting point up a few steps so you don't have to start at the bottom. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, you kind of just answered the question, but what is your, what, what do you, what do you think as a, as an entertainer in the TV business, what do you think is your, what is your opinion of the future of cable TV in the way that it seems like YouTube is sort of uh, becoming the go-to spot? That, uh, that's a great question, and I, I think y- you may be in a better position to answer it than me because I'm I'm pretty ignorant. I'm willfully ignorant to show business. You know, as you know, show business is super gross. Uh, it's much more business than show, and I'm a theater actor first and foremost, and so. Yeah. It, you know the the um, the values of performing theater feel a lot more like a wood shop where you're agreeing to do something for people that that is medicinal in some way without the promise of of great monetary returns, but you get it. Like it's, it's kind of like farming too. Like you're like it's all right. I I have plenty of yeah. carrots and I have fresh bacon, so I'll be cool. Um, Show business, especially television, is is just so materialistic and it's such a, a churning machine. It's weird because so much of our nation, let alone let alone the rest of the planet, so much of our nation is still watching the old-fashioned like network, you know. The CBS comedies like Big Bang Theory are still scoring these big ratings. So that there's a – which tells me there's a large part of the population – they're still old fashioned where they come home from work and they turn on the TV and watch it. Uh, but the numbers of people watching cable and watching like binge watching, especially the young people like college students, for example, it used to be a big deal that you would have your first TV and like your VCR in your dorm room. And that was like a, a, a rite of passage. And, during Parks and Rec, I learned that college students n- no longer have TVs. They watch everything on a computer. So there, there's a, certainly a big shift happening. And I think over the next 10 years, it'll continue, you know, to, to grow and grow until, you know, the networks have to somehow meld with the online delivery systems. Where that's going, I don't know. I mean, so many predictions were made. 10 years ago that, you know, 
we'd all be watching TV on our thumbnails uh, by this point. <laughs> um, right. I, and I, and I purposely stay out of it. Just whoever's, whoever had, like, for example, when I, when I taped my American ham special at the time, Netflix was the spot to like land your comedy special. And so I got them to make a deal with me. Now Megan and I are about to shoot our summer 69 special and Netflix is no longer the spot. They like overextended themselves. So now they're shrinking down their content. And so we're exploring other avenues and in another three years, it'll be somebody else. And so it's an exciting time. YouTube, you know, uh, you're, you're, as you're finding, you can create your own channel. Um, and it, it, it's going to be interesting to see what happens going forward. We, you know, we hope that whoever broadcasts us on their channel, that they'll continue to have a spot for us. Uh, but the nice thing is if, if you're worried, if you're interested in good content, then it doesn't matter where you put your stuff. You know, you can just like, like big, musical acts rock stars are now just dumping their albums for free because they get it they're like this is going to get pirated anyway so i might as well just dump it for free and and receive the goodwill and the cool buzz of doing that because and then make my money going on tour or selling t-shirts or whatever it is but you know the old paradigms are all crumbled um and and so for Megan and I, we we just like to perform good material. We like to be involved with good content. And sometimes you get paid, and sometimes you don't. And uh, you you know we'll just keep plugging away. And um, if I have to sell our our castle in Iceland, so be it. Uh, I can I can learn to live without uh, um, an Icelandic moat <laughs> and other and other hardships. <laughs> Yeah, that would be a tough one to give up for sure. Knock on wood. Well, typically we wrap up the show by talking about like what we're watching, but I think we should all just give it to uh, Nick's new book. So tell us final details on like book, where to get it, when it's out, all that stuff. So everybody can go pick it up and everybody go pick it up so that he'll write a second one. (laughs) That's generous. Uh, Thank you. Um, It comes out. October 18th, uh, anywhere people sell books. Um, it'll also be available on our website, offermanwoodshop.com. Um, and I, I do a thing on there where I sell it for the cover price, but I sign it. Uh, so you can get a signed copy. Um, I used to, in the early days, I used to like write something else, but uh, unfortunately you're all purchasing my books and so too many uh, there are too many for me to even be able to sign so I no longer can write a message like to mirth um, but it's understood if you get a signed book from me know that it's written to mirth uh, <laughs> the first time Nick the, the the first time I came to your shop I'm not even sure if it was the only time I came to your shop I can't remember but you were sitting at a desk almost the entire time signing books while we hung out yeah it's 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 really killing my Jimmy time. So, um, <laughs> I, I appreciate it, but it's a it's a two two edged sword. Um, okay. Also, the audio book is interesting because the book has thirteen projects how to make stuff from something as simple as as whiskey coasters all the way up to like a cool dining chair, um, a slab table, a big really cool bed that Lee kind of invented a cool piece of knockdown joinery for this, uh, Oak oak bed. Um, and so the audio book is a little bit of a conundrum because a lot of the how to projects are kind of useless unless you have, you know, the material to look at. So I did two projects on the audio book and you can get a URL when you get the audio book where you can get the photos and the text online to, to accompany you, but to replace the rest of those missing projects, uh, I recorded some songs with my friend Jeff Tweedy, who uh, is the front man of the band Wilco. So the audiobook actually has like six bonus tracks of uh, my original woodworking songs, That's great. That's such great. as American White Oak, 
The Lazy Carpenter, and uh, the title track, Good Clean Fun, and Music to Sand By. Uh, <laughs> it, it's really, they're really fun. I'm very proud of them. Um, so all that stuff becomes available uh, on the 18th, and it's going to make a hell of a Christmas present. It's, um, I'm, I'm really proud of this book, uh, partly because so much of it was a collaborative effort on the part of my community. You know, um, my, my previous books, I, I, w- I would not be as vocally proud about because it's like, I wrote, I wrote a bunch of stuff. I hope you like it. Um, it's my heart's in the right place, but you know, I'm kind of, I'm kind of new at books, but this book, because it was a simply a, you know, it's like if you asked me to write about band-aids, I'd be like, you know what, you guys, I can write you some great shit about band-aids because they're amazing. And, uh, you know, uh, and so because it's about woodworking and has very little to do with me, uh, or my, my ego as an artist, um, I'm, I can, I can be very proud of it and, and tell you that it's a gas. It's, we, we've talked a lot about the sincere points of the book, but there's also tons of jokes in the book. There, there's a four-page comic book of me and Chris Pratt uh, homoerotically chopping down a tree. <laughs> it's well drawn, too. It is really well drawn. Uh, my friend yeah, Ethan drawn. Nicole, who does Axe Comp, uh, drew it. My wife does, does a really funny uh, section on shop fashion. Um, so it's... I, I, I think, um, and it also has no bad words, which is a, a, a new thing for me. Um, but I wanted it, I wanted anybody to be ha- comfortable buying this for a kid or for anybody, you know, in, in any kind of household, uh, you can all appreciate good, clean fun. Right on. Well, that's awesome. Everybody go, uh, go pick up Nick's book. Before we go, real quick, I got to thank our supporters on Patreon because they make this show possible. So especially Make, Build, Modify, Luis Gonzalez, and Dan K. Make. They're our top uh, supporters over there. You guys are awesome. Everybody that helps us out on Patreon is fantastic, and we greatly appreciate it. Um, Update on the Boston situation for December 3rd. Unfortunately, we don't really have any information, new information on the venue we're still working on a bigger venue so we can open up some more tickets. Um, I will ask that if you got a ticket and something has changed like, and you can't make it, please go back and return that ticket so other people can come because we've got it capped right now and we can't accept any more people unless we get a bigger venue. So That's what I keep telling people. They keep asking me. If you are going to come, awesome. We'll see you there. That's a great problem to have. Yeah, yeah, it's not bad. <laughs> um, Nick, thank you so much for hanging out with us and for being on the show. And we'd love to have you back anytime you're, you know, sitting still long enough to do it. Thank you. I, I will look forward to it. Let me, let me get some work done. So I have something to talk about, but I'm, I'm completely grateful. The pleasure is all mine. I, uh, I really admire all three of you and, uh, and thank you very much for giving me your time. Nick, thank you very much for the mention and the, and the chapter and, it's it, it was an honor and an unexpected one at that. You you told me out of nowhere that you did it, and I was surprised. So thank you. You beautiful son of a. <laughs> <laughs> more there's more where that came from. <laughs> Thanks for listening, everybody, and we will catch you next week. Nick taught me how to be an affectionate man. Thank you, Nick. I love you. <laughs>